I'd like to now uh, hand over to Molly Duggins, who you have met, uh, and she's talking about crafting uh, colonial picturesque. So Molly is a lecturer here in art history and theory, uh, and she employs a cross-disciplinary approach to examine the visual and material culture of colonialism in the 19th and early 20th century. And her research focuses on colonial women's craft works and its uses and trajectories within the British Empire, with a kind of emphasis on cross-cultural practices. And Mar Molly is currently co-editing uh, with Kathleen Davidson a volume called Sea Currents, 19th Century Art, Science and Culture, which is forthcoming from Bloomsbury. So join me in welcoming Molly. Thank you, Priya, and thank you so much for your lovely paper, Fiona. I feel so honored to be up on the stage at the same time as Fiona. I'm very excited. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose country we meet and pay my respects uh, to their elders past, present, and future. Portable culture-bearing objects, 19th century women's albums, were a significant vehicle for the transmission of the picturesque to the Australian colonies. Far more than a circulating image repository, however, these albums were enlisted in articulating ideologies of femininity and domesticity through the art of arrangement, the principal criterion of women's craft work. Focusing on an album compiled by Eliza Young Husband in Adelaide between 1856 and 1865 in the collections of the National Library, this case study draws a parallel between the picturesque's cut and paste approach to forming a picture of nature and album assemblage as a craft practice. In particular, it cons considers how album assemblage was used to aestheticize representations of the colonial landscape, indigenous Australians, and frontier violence. One of the most pervasive forms of amateur artistic practice in the 18th and 19th centuries Album making represented a key medium for the production and collection, consumption and display of art and craft. Through the selection and arrangement of images, objects and text, album compilation became a malleable medium for personal expression, with the compiler taking on the role of a curator. Composite artifacts, albums generated visual, textual and material narratives that were anchored in the book-like frame of the album. They were experienced sequentially through turning the album's pages and were activated through oral commentary. Performative objects, albums were enlisted in com communicating status and identity. According to an, an inscription on the opening page of Eliza's album, uh, Eliza, or Lily Young Husband, as she was known to family and friends, was given her album by her mother in October 1856. The language of flowers, a popular floral vocabulary that encoded plants with emotional and moral significance, features prominently in the album through imagery associated with the lily, Eliza's namesake, which signified majesty and purity. There are several watercolors of uh, floral bouquets, such as the one you see here on the screen, uh, which were uh, conventional sentimental gestures of admiration, so, so virtual real bouquets, if you will, uh, in which a lily is centrally placed, as well as a poem entitled Lily of the Murray, in which young husband is portrayed as a tall and queen-like naturalized flower, an acclimatized Antipodean maiden, symbolic of a young Miss Australia blossoming with promise. Indeed, three years before she received her album, Young Husband performed the christening of the Lady Augusta, the first paddle steamer to navigate the River Murray in 1853, wearing, according to the press report, a pretty wreath of native flowers in her hair. Her father, William Young Husband, a South Australian pastoralist and shipping merchant, was instrumental in pioneering trade on the Murray, and this enterprise is referenced in her, in her album in a sketch of the steamboat Corio. So that's the sketch you see up there on the left, um, which is passing over uh, the sandbar at the mouth of the Murray on its first outward, outward voyage from the Goa, uh, which was Australia's first inland port established in 1857. An, an accompanying inscription informs us that, quote, Miss Young Husband was the first English lady who ever crossed that long dreaded obstruction to Australia's inland river. Spectators on the shore, possibly members of the, the Naranjuri language group of the Lower Murray River, witnessed the event. As such imagery suggests, colonial women were complicit in the creation and circulation of narratives of colonial progress. Through the album, such narratives were woven into the social fabric of the drawing room, 
a symbolic bastion of British domesticity and civility, which through its centrality to colonial culture was as significant an agent of colonization as the frontier. Albums were quotidian social objects that were both personal and communal, operating within a culture of politeness and exchange. Social facilitators, they provided a networking platform for the compiler, cementing bonds of affection between family and friends through reciprocal, reciprocal contributions, not unlike the ubiquitous social media platforms of today. Compiled in the years leading up to her marriage to Henry Shipster in 1864, Young Husband's album contains many such contributions, including, on the left, a pencil still life of shells and seaweed by her husband, and on the right, an embossed paper scrap of an open book, which is inscribed in, in a tiny hand inscription, Australian flora respectfully dedicated to the best dancer in the place, by an admirer signed with the initials WW. Such images and inscriptions reveal the album's significance in fostering relationships for women in colonial society. Albums were also an expressive vehicle for the compiler to articulate cultural values through aesthetic traditions. The legacy of romanticism, which emphasized the affective qualities of image and objects, is evident in the album's repertoire of European scenic views, poetry, keepsakes, and artifacts intended to, to display sensibility and cultivated taste. Examples such as a drawing of the windswept Welsh mountain setting of Shakespeare's Cymbeline, a commemorative card for the Crimean War, and a garland bedecked poem on the forget-me-not reveal how Young Husband's album was transformed through sentiment into a secular reliquary of sorts. Its emotional agency enhanced through the intimate encounter its book-like form necessitated, which prioritized the sense of touch in addition to sight. Indeed, the textural surface of woven silk threads, uh, threads of the memorial card um, in the center begs to be touched, encouraging tactile engagement. Picturesque drawings and prints were a key form of romantic consumption in albums that reinforced British identity. A mediator between beauty and the sublime, the picturesque genre as espoused by William Gilpin in 1768 transformed nature into a landscape of arranged forms and motifs to create a harmony of variation. For Gilpin, the, quote, picturesque composition consisted in uniting in one whole a variety of parts. Crumbling ruins, castles and estates, cliffs, torrent streams, and blasted trees, which memorialized the distant British landscape, were painted and pasted in colonial albums, creating cultural topographies of taste that spanned the empire. The commercialization and proliferation of the picturesque in the 19th century that emerged in response to the development of industry, trade, and imperialism saturated the drawing room where it was enlisted by tastemakers to promote the blending of art and nature in the home and garden through language that centered upon the art of arrangement. Perhaps it is no surprise that the picturesque as an agent of domesticating the landscape became ensconced in domestic ritual. Painted by Maria Caroline Brownrigg at the same time that Young Husband was compiling her album, this watercolor of the drawing room of Yarra Cottage in Port Stephens reveals how the domestic interior operated as a cultural switch point that, trans that transformed nature into culture. Framed picturesque landscapes hang on the wall, a bird sits in its gilded cage in the corner, a bouquet in a vase anchors the center table. A side of feminine industry, Brownrigg's da Brown daughters are arranged around the center table, embroidering and writing. A crocheted floral footstool in the foreground completes the picture. Craft, as this intimate scene reveals, was enlisted to cultivate nature and by extension taste in the drawing room as an expanded picturesque pursuit. The art of arrangement not only permeates the scene, but is implicit in its very creation. Brownrigg incorporated collaged elements such as the bouquet and books uh, into the composition. So there's actually cut out watercolors incorporated into this painted backdrop. Um, so that the vase of flowers and those little cute little books in the front. And I should mention, this is a tiny um, jewel of a picture uh, that was recently acquired. It was in private hands for a while and was recently acquired by the National Portrait Gallery. But it, it is here in Sydney um, on exhibit in the Sydney, Sydney Living Museum's exhibition um, uh, on music in the colonies, which you can all go and see around the corner if you are interested. Um, it's a lovely little picture, and the exhibition is wonderful as well. Um, 
Sharing the same aesthetic foundation of selection and arrangement as the picturesque, craftwork featuring, featuring natural motifs extended the visual landscape of the picturesque into material terrain. This was especially true when natural materials were employed, such as the pressed seaweeds in this cut paperwork basket from Young Husband's album. The arrangement not only reveals an attention to the variety of color and form of the bouquet, but also features a textured intricacy that evokes the picturesque's penchant for roughness. In establishing a dialogue with the natural realm, such fancy work offered a medium through which to engage with the local Australian landscape within the precepts of an internationalizing craft commodity marketplace. Invigorated by popular natural history practices and the rise of seaside culture in the Victorian era, beachcombing was transformed into a veritable global industry. Numerous examples of seaweed pictures, such as that in Young Husband's album, often accompanied by the verse, call us not weeds, we are flowers of the sea. And that's, um, uh, you can see that written down at the bottom of this larger collage. And it's also in Young Husband's album is here. The exact same first verse circulated throughout the spaces of empire. Um, these arrangements were arranged in albums throughout the British Empire and published in craft manuals and natural history guides. Through pressed flora wrought into decorative arrangements in colonial albums, such craftwork contributed to the production of a material picturesque that memorialized the British landscape while fostering an intimate connection with local coastal ecologies. As repository, repositories for picturesque imagery and craftwork, albums embodied the drawing room in microcosm. And I'm just showing you here that beautifully ornate cover, uh, mother of pearl lacquered cover, and um, the floral end papers, which to me, you know, look very much like contemporary wallpaper of the day. So you really do get the sense that this is a drawing room in miniature. So albums functioned as mobile domiciles wherein women could exercise their feminine prerogative to culturize the colonial environment through the art of arrangement. Yet albums were more than mere repositories for picturesque pursuits. Album compilation was a picturesque practice in its own right that exercised the skills of selecting and arranging, cutting and pasting to harmonize varied contents. Within the pages of her album, Young Husband not only assembles a repertoire of European scenery, but also implicates the colonial landscape in this picturesque platform through the interspersal of bush landscapes and representations of indigenous Australians. Entwined with notions of travel and discovery, the picturesque genre evolved from its initial focus on landscapes of the British Isles to the appropriative and mastering gaze of empire. Its aesthetic formula, easily emulated, provided a framework to reduce the colonial landscape and cultural other into touristic spectacle, while projecting a powerful language of British identity that traversed geography. The colonial picturesque is exemplified in Young Husband's album in an oil painting on a flattened, flattened juvenile leaf of a white box gum by an unattributed artist working in the style of Alfred Eustace. A studied transcription of the picturesque, eucalypts, including um, the requisite blasted tree, which you can see a few little um, blasted branches sticking out, um, frame a meandering waterway, waterway to create an idyllic bush scene. The conflation of micro and macro perspectives in which the landscape is framed through the oval shape of the gum leaf support reflects a common colonial trajectory of familiarization in which the Australian environment was apprehended specimen by specimen, parcel of land by parcel of land in a process of domestication. Such gum leaf painting pr was produced by colonial amateur artists in the second half of the 19th century as bush curiosities that circulated through commercial and exhibitionary networks, contributing to the sentimental inscription of Australia, Australian flora into an emerging nationalist identity. Within Young Husband's album, it becomes a drawing, drawing room decoration engaged in the process of acculturation. Indigenous Australians are also subjected to the picturesque gaze in Young Husband's album through a grisaille-like moonlit corroboree scene of Narungara people at Wallaroo, South Australia, by the artist William Wyatt, whose father was South Australia's third interim protector of Aborigines in the late 1830s. With the discovery of copper in 1859, the development of mining at Wallaroo and its surrounds became integral to the narrative of colonial progress in South Australia. The impact of the mining industry on the Narunga is unrecorded in Wyatt's painting, which belongs to a significant genre of colonial corroboree imagery that consigned indigenous Australians to a romantic prehistory 
masking the dispossession and violence of colonization. The pattern of the dancer's raised arms and bent legs resembles the intersecting forms of branches and trunks of the surrounding trees, while the dynamism of the dancing figures is reinforced by the energetic brushstrokes of foliage, conflating the dancers with their environment. Through this alignment of indigenous culture and nature, a conventional colonial equation, equation, indigenous Australians were transformed into a distancing vision of a primitive other underwritten by an imperial hierarchical notion of race that legitimized their removal from the land. By incorporating such imagery into their albums, colonial women were complicit in reinforcing this nostalgic enshrinement of settler fantasy. This picturesque artifice um, in the corroboree scene becomes apparent when compared to Wyatt's drawings of indigenous figures camping, dancing, and throwing spears in a contemporary sketchbook in the National Library. The casual atmosphere and realistic detail in a sketch of a family sitting around a fire outside a shelter contrasts with the dramatic contrivances of his corroboree scene. Through its inclusion in Young Husband's album, we must also consider the corroboree's intended drawing room audience. The exotic appeal of the scene would have been enhanced through the intimate handling of the album. As Kate Smith has suggested, the juxtaposition of, quote, lily white feminine hands, the embodiment, uh, the supposed embodiment of civility, with such imagery served to heighten the contrast between cultures. Viewed within the framework of the album, Wyatt's corroboree painting is inscribed in a picturesque narrative in which the colonial landscape becomes an extension of the British. The oval frame, a recurring motif in Young Husband's album, represents a device of sentimental enclosure. In this regard, it contrasts with the, with the pervasive quadrilateral frame, which, as David Hansen has argued, engaged in mapping, uh, was engaged in mapping, classifying, and compartmentalizing the colonial landscape and its inhabitants. While the rectangular frame was one of order, the oval frame was one of emotion. Its use in visual and material culture for the vignette, the cartouche, and the sentimental portrait imbued it with a sense of intimacy. In addition to this picturesque imagery, Young Husband's album contains views of an inhospitable Australian landscape distinguished by frontier conflict, notably drawings by William Oswald Hodgkinson relating to the ill-fated uh, Victorian exhibition of 1860 uh, and 61 that attempted to cross the Australian continent from Melbourne to the Gulf of Carpentaria, led by Robert O'Hara Burke and William John Wills. Hodgkinson, a journalist working for The Age, joined the exhibition at Swan Hill, traveling with a supply party led by William Wright. This drawing depicts their camp near the Bulla River in the southwest corner of Queensland, where the party engaged in frequent and strained contact with the local Wankamura people. Hodgkinson's drawings captures, drawing captures the climactic moment of conflict between these two groups in this reconstructed form of visual reportage. Such imagery of frontier violence is rare in the visual archive. While it provides critical evidence of the legacy of colonial aggression and dispossession, its original reception remains understudied. How would such imagery have been displayed and discussed within the drawing room setting for which the album was intended as a form of polite, genteel entertainment? Hodgkinson survived the exhibition and presented this drawing, as well as another of the exhibition party's desolate campsite at Corleato, with a love poem to young husband in Adelaide before departing with the South Australian Burke Relief Expedition. And I've just included a few flowery ex excerpts, that's all you need to see, um, from this poem, this very long-winded poem. Clearly, such images operated as a form of sentimental exchange, solidified through their inscription in the album. Their display in the drawing room also catered to the contemporary appetite for illustrated accounts of exploration and travel that highlighted the adversity of the Australian landscape in the face of so-called colonial progress. Interestingly, Hodgkinson's gifted Burke and Wales images are not displayed consecutively in the album, but rather are interspersed with romantic and picturesque imagery. The still life of shells, a sketch of a young woman gazing out the window, Wyatt's corroboree scene, and a, a study of, of Viola from Twelfth Night. Viewed sequentially, these individual compositions become part of a sentimental collective. This seemingly incongruous arrangement amongst ornamental still lifes and Shakespearean scenes tempers the impact of these images as a testimony of frontier violence. They become neutralized through their inscription in the picturesque platform of the album.
The lens of the picturesque separated the tourist from the toured, the colonizer from the colonized, allowing for the negotiation of the colonial landscape from the safe distance of mastery. Through the picturesque pursuit of album assemblage, colonial women, such as Young Husband, aestheticized the colonial landscape, crafting narratives of colonial progress and a developing colonial identity. The picturesque strategies of selection and arrangement within the space of the album presented a versatile vehicle for women to personally engage with and negotiate key tropes of imperial representation from the intimate space of the drawing room. In doing so, colonial women were key perpetrators of the polite violence of colonialism. Thank you. <laughs>